In the spring of 2001, a Soyuz taxi mission to the space station was being scheduled to take place in October of 2002. At first, the crew roster was to be Commander Sergei Zelyotin, Flight Engineer Frank DeWin, and American singer Lance Bass, who would join the crew for its one-week mission on board the station. However, the initial mission roster plan fell through due to mission organizers' failure to meet the terms of the contract, and by September 2002, they had discontinued training Bass. Flight planners filled the vacant seat left by Lance Bass with Russian cosmonaut Yuri Lenchokov. On October 30th, 2002, Soyuz TMA-1 launched from Baikonur atop a Soyuz FG rocket. The Soyuz TMA is an upgraded version of the Soyuz TM spacecraft and features several changes to accommodate requirements requested by NASA in order to service the International Space Station, including more latitude in the height and weight of the crew and an improved parachute system. Soyuz TMA is also the first expendable spacecraft to feature a glass cockpit. Soyuz TMA looks identical to the early Soyuz TM spacecraft on the outside, but interior differences allow it to accommodate taller occupants with new adjustable couches. Soyuz TMA-1 approached the station and docked to the Pierce on November 1, 2002. The crew spent a week on board the station and returned back to Earth in Soyuz TM-34 on November 9, 2002. On November 24, 2002, Shuttle Endeavour launched STS-113 to the station, carrying both the P-1 Trust and the Expedition 6 crew for the station. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, go for main engine start. of Space Shuttle Endeavour, another building block for the foundation of the International Space Station. Houston now controlling the flight of Endeavour, three new residents headed for the International Space Station. Endeavour completing the roll, the shuttle now in a heads down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Endeavour's three liquid fuel man engines throttling back now in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the orbiter as it breaks through the sound barrier. Forty-five seconds into the flight, the main engine soon to begin to rev up to full throttle, 104% of rated performance. The main engines, along with the three fuel cells and three hydraulic power units, all functioning normally. Endeavour Houston, go at throttle up. Go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Jim Weatherby, joined on the flight deck by pilot Paul Lockhart, flight engineer John Harrington, and mission specialist Mike Lopez Alegria. The Expedition 6 crew, Kent Bowersox, Nikolai Budarin, and Don Pettit, seated down on the mid deck, headed for their new home in space. One minute, 22 seconds into the flight of Endeavour. 
the orbiter already ten miles downrange thirteen miles in altitude shedding its weight as it heads toward main engine cutoff targets All of Endeavour systems in good shape, one minute, 50 seconds into the flight as we stand by for solid rocket booster separation. Booster officer confirms a good solid rocket booster separation, guidance now converging. Endeavour's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming the shuttle for a precise target in space. Here's a view from the station of us eight miles away, and you'll see the burn where we, right there, ignite the ohms to commit to target intercept. With Commander Jim Weatherby and pilot Paul Lockhart at the controls, Endeavour docked with the station on November 25, 2002 to begin seven days of station assembly, spacewalks, crew and equipment transfers. This was Endeavour's last flight before entering its orbital major modification period, which would include modernizing the cockpit. The system is a, a real testament to the engineers and folks who designed the vehicle. It's amazing to me that you can be flying this fast and uh, be within a half an inch of where you need to be and within a, a hundredth of a foot per second of the desired target at uh, contact. We have sped the video up here. Uh, it really is like watching grass go in a Moscow winter, but we... Uh, <laughs> First thing we need to do uh, once we are finished slapping each other on the back is start bringing some of the stuff over. That uh, first bag was what the, contains the seat liners that the new crew will use to put in the Soyuz and then of course the EMUs for the spacewalks. Getting ready the night before the first spacewalk, we had to put some anti-fog in the helmets and uh, configure all the tools. It's a pretty tedious job, it usually takes us uh, well into the night um, and the next morning it's time to get up early and hit the deck running. On the 26th of November, the crew lifted the P-1 truss out of the cargo bay and made it to the SO truss. The P-1 truss is 13.7 meters or about 45 feet long and 6.4 meters or 15 feet wide and 4 meters or 13 feet high. The P-1 truss is nearly identical to the starboard side S-1 truss delivered on board STS-112. The P-1 truss provides structural support for the space station and flows 637 pounds of anhydrous ammonia through three heat rejection radiators. Mounted to the P-1 is the second crew and equipment translation aid, or CETA, that can be manually operated along the mobile transporter line. The crew conducted three EVAs during STS-113, helping to install the truss and installing other equipment to the outside of the station. A shot of Don uh, and Paco inside. We're doing the uh, prep. This is where uh, the suit, with, including the uh, person inside, weighs about 500 pounds, but you can just kind of guide them being guided into the uh, crew lock. And this is Don as he's closing the uh, IV hatch, we call it. And just get ready to start driving the motorized bolt assemblies, the MBAs, which actually bolt one truss to the other. And Don working at the robotic workstation as he's driving those uh, bolts.
Once uh, they were securely fastened to each other, we got the go to go outside, and there's really nothing that I could uh, adequately say that would describe what this feels like. You see here the two pieces of truss. This is S0 down here and P1 up here. And the first thing we do is uh, connect the two together electrically while John is um, um, reconfiguring the CETA cart, which you saw in a previous photo. Um, so that we can take the launch locks off. Thanks to the wireless vision system, you can see up close uh, some of the work that we do. It's uh, not very complicated, but it's, um, it's interesting. This is, I'm using a manual ratchet, about 50 foot pounds are required to uh, turn the bolt. And I'll turn those for one turn. So look like uh, from inside of the shuttle looking out to P1. And then once I get those removed, I use the uh, pistol grip tool, or PGT, and I let go, and my tether kind of pulls it out of the slot. And here I get a chance to go ahead and stow it. It's, this is like hurting cats also, getting it all stowed back into the bag. It looks a lot easier there than it was in flight, let me tell you. <laughs> um, EVA2, the next thing we had to do was connect the uh, two pieces of the truss together hydraulically, if you will. These are what we call fluid jumpers, and they carry ammonia, which is a cooling fluid used on the uh, space station. And uh, you'll see John is handing me um, the end of them, and then he will join me on the side of the truss. This is uh, what happens when the sun goes down. This is real time. It doesn't take very long at all. Once we get them connected, we open the bale uh, to open the valve to allow the um, two pieces to be connected together and this is just sort of an overview of the two jumpers uh, in place. The uh, launch restraints that were in place on P1 had to be removed once they were in flight and this is Mike taking one of the keel pins off and he's installing a bolt and then once uh, he had it in his hands it was my job to translate the CETA cart down the rail which was a fabulous experience just by fingertips. You can, uh, it's a huge mass and just lightly uh, pushing it down the rail. As Mike controls it we have to take the uh, the keel pin and now Mike will install it inside the truss. And this is, looks like from one of the cameras on the back of the uh, payload bay. Another uh, ability we wanted to leave on the station was the ability to use this wireless vision system when the shuttle wasn't there. This is an antenna that's uh, used to transmit the signal into the station. And uh, we carried the, sh the antenna out of the airlock with us and then it attached it to a stanchion, which you see here. This whole thing is uh, about the size of a person. You'll see John here is on the very end of P1 and he's going to go over the edge and this is what it looks like on the edge of the universe as far as I could tell. It's quite a view. I guarantee he's holding on strong with his right hand. <laughs> As soon as the sun went down again, I grabbed that whole stanchion thing and handed it to John, and he's uh, locating it here in the uh, foot place where we're going to attach it using the another, again, the pistol grip tool to attach it. And once it's all in place, we can take the cover off like uh, chicken dinner. Consider this the ride of my life. Uh, the robotic arm is coming into position right below the cedar cart, and it's my job to uh, install a foot restraint onto the arm and this is Mike removing the, the uh, little, they're called wheel bogies, as I pull the uh, seated cart away from the rail. And then I had the opportunity to ride the robotic arm, courtesy of uh, Don Pettit, uh, all the way around underneath the uh, space station to the fullest end. And it started off and it started getting dark. And it was, uh, it was the most, the, the blackest black I'd ever seen. And as we came back around the, the uh, starboard side, the sun came up in the most tremendously brilliant white light illuminating the station. And Mike guided us in, and here he's putting the last wheel bogey in place and locked it in. Well, we knew we were going to have to come inside soon, so we took the opportunity to take a couple last pictures, um, and all good things must come to an end. But we went inside feeling that we hadn't lost anything, and uh, later we confirmed everything because we double count for just to make sure. Getting out of the suit is um, is a relief. It's like uh, you're coming home after a long day's work. You can see uh, John and I look both a little whipped. Transfer was a big, big job. Uh, uh, during this time, we had to get uh, large bags like the 5 MLE bag floating up there, plus 
all the other uh, hardware for EVA support and uh, just for the Expedition 6 crew to have while in orbit. You can see lots of different things going on, Don's doing IFM, while well, everything else is going on, so busy time. And here we're installing one of the payloads, uh, actually exchanging, we had a new one brought up on the shuttle and putting it in the, to the station and then uh, this one's going back home on the shuttle. Hello, that my crew, Don, Nikolai and I will be able to work as well over the next four or uh, however many months we end up living on station. <laughs> Hopefully more than four. And this concludes our ceremony for today. Thank you all for joining us. Again, a change of command ceremony steeped in naval tradition. Uh, it's a, an honor to be part of ceremonies like this. I mentioned that another tradition is to put the flight patch up on board the vehicle. Uh, we have an awful lot of flights getting ready to go. Luckily, the station's getting bigger now. And here's Valeri installing our patch. Also in the node, we have a separate area for the expedition crews that have been up there. Number five, looks good. Its mission complete, Endeavour undocked from the station on December 2nd, 2002, and performed the standard fly-around maneuver before separating from the station. Endeavour remained in orbit for five more days before deorbiting and returning to Earth on December 7th, 2002. I found the undock and the fly-around on both flights, STS-111 and 113, to be a pretty emotional time, especially for the station crews because it's the first time after they've lived there for five or six months to back away and look at the station and see how large it's grown. It's really a beautiful time to look at the station with the earth in the background. And on re-entry day, um, well, one of the three re-entry days we had, uh, put my suit on two legs at a time. Uh, here's Paco. There's only three of us on the flight deck. I'm the, uh, the lower portion of the screen here, MS-2, and uh, down on the mid-deck. Expedition 5 in the mid-deck. We tried to give them a smooth ride home, but it's not possible. It's a really rough train ride coming down. These calls are all Paul helping me. The next shuttle flight was STS-107, flown by Columbia, which was not destined to dock with the International Space Station. Columbia launched on January 16, 2003, and conducted a multitude of international scientific experiments during its 15 days, 22 hours, 20 minutes, and 32 seconds in orbit. Before reaching orbit during launch, a large piece of foam debris hit the bottom of Columbia as it made its ascent, similar to what had happened on STS-112. Though concerning to the crew, they performed their on-orbit mission flawlessly.
Columbia began to re-enter as planned, but the heat shield, comprised of thousands of heat-absorbing tiles, was compromised due to the damage sustained during initial ascent. The heat of re-entry was free to spread into the damaged portion of the orbiter, ultimately causing its disintegration and the loss of all hands. After the disaster, NASA grounded the shuttle fleet completely, and for the next two years, crew and cargo to the International Space Station stood on the shoulders of Roscosmos. <laughs>